Yeah, I'm not very good at that actually, uh, in terms of not doing so. I was intrigued that you were both a ballerina and a violinist. <laughs> To if you're going to be good at it, right? And enough to learn. Pretty. So, Ernesto, your bio doesn't match your profile here. You got promoted, right? You got promoted. Oh, that was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Ahmed Nursesian, thank you for coming. Uh, I will briefly uh, give you a introduction to the people at the round table and then we will get going. Uh, Maria Delosier is sitting there. She's lawyer and assistant attorney, district attorney in New York City. Prior to becoming a prosecutor, she clerked for the DC Court of Appeals and also served as special legal counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee on the nomination of Supreme Court Just Chief, Chief Justice John Roberts. Prior to becoming a lawyer, she enjoyed a career in media after graduating from Northwestern University. Professor Nancy Di Tommaso is sitting there. She is the Vice Dean for Faculty and Research and Professor of Management and Global Business at Rutgers Business School. Her research specialties include the management of diversity and change, the management of knowledge-based organizations, and the management of scientists and engineers. She has co-authored and co-edited five books and has had articles published in many journals. Her recent book is The American Non-Dilemma and is available from the Russell Sage Foundation. And on the table. Sorry? And on the table. And on the table. <laughs> <laughs> she has been elected to several national offices in various professional associations, including a position on the American Sociological Association Council as chair of the organizations and occupations section of the ASA, and as president of the Society for the Advancement of Socioeconomics. Ernesto Rubin is associate assistant professor at Columbia Business School. Well, it says assistant one place, associate one place, and one is, oh, you're associate assistant. professor no, of management, Columbia Business School. Assistant professor. At Columbia Business School. Yes. Okay. <laughs> His research interests lie within behavior and public economics. He investigates the role played by social norms and particular psychological traits on activities that are economically relevant for public policy and business strategy. More recently, he's been working on the role of reciprocity in the, reaction, in the interaction between special interest groups and politicians, the effect of present bias preferences on procrastination, and how implicit associations can lead to biased expectations and discrimination. Ernesto has taught courses in public economics, microeconomics, experimental economics, statistic and strategy at numerous universities. 
Patricia Taylor, who is married to Kenneth Taylor, the former Canadian ambassador to Iran, who's sitting back there. She has followed her husband on many of his assignments and therefore has held positions at various cities around the world, Guatemala City, Detroit, Karachi, London, Tehran, and New York. In Ottawa, she was head of the National Hep Hepatitis Reference Laboratory and became chief of the Virus Diagnostic Services Division. She has held a number of research fellowships and scholarships, including international fellowship from the American Association of University Women, Fulbright and Rockefeller Foundation grants, and served on several Canadian, U.S., and World Health Organization public health and expert scientific advisory committees. She's a member of the Order of Canada and has an honorary doctors of, Doctor of Law from St. Francis Xavier University. Her awards include Woman of the Year from the Canadian Women's Club, the Harry Edmonds Award for Lifetime Achievement from International House New York. She was a violinist uh, with the universities of Queensland and, Cal and California orchestras and danced with ballet companies in Australia, Guatemala, and California. She currently serves as the chair of the Women's International Leadership Advisory Council of I House New York. International House New York. International. Thank you. So we can just get going. Well, I feel humbled. <laughs> so I'm going to let one of y'all start. Well, I, you know, what puzzles me continuously in traveling around the world is that the United States seems to be out of step with many countries, other countries in the world, such as the Nordic countries, where there is a high employment rate amongst women. So I, I, what comments might you have on that? Well, I attended a conference recently where one of the uh, participants addressed that issue and mentioned that um, some of the social democratic policies that have affected women in the workforce in the Nordic countries essentially emerged when some of the Nordic countries were concerned about the influence of immigrants on their economy. So essentially some of those policies emerged essentially to keep the labor force more Swedish or Norwegian or whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, while we can look at those policies and uh, admire them, uh, I think that it reminds us that for any kind of assessment of what's happening to women in the labor force or women in the workforce or women in social relationships in general, that we have to look at a number of different factors. We have to look at the social, the legal, the economic, mm -hmm. uh, the behavioral, the psychological. Um, since by training I'm a sociologist and do study diversity in the labor force, including race, ethnicity, gender, and other kinds of differences, um, I, I did, I, I'm fairly familiar with the uh, at least the research findings for the U.S., uh, not as much the research findings around the world, although when we're talking about women in the labor force, particularly in uh, advanced countries, it looks pretty much the same. Um, so let me just mention a couple things, and then maybe that can spark some of the conversation. Um, there's a very good book that just came out uh, fairly recently called Documenting Desegregation that uh, analyzed the data from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission from 1966 through 2005, and looking particularly at the issues of what has happened since the passage of the Civil Rights Movement to the segregation for various kinds of groups uh, from white men in the labor force in the US. And the big story there is that uh, much less has changed than we probably assume. Um, the biggest story of the stories in that book is that essentially white men have retained their access to the best jobs at the same proportion that they had when the civil rights movement was passed, and in some cases, in some 
types of occupations and industries, they've actually enhanced their access to those types of jobs. So that the access for um, women of various types and minorities in the labor force have both basically come from growth of jobs uh, at the lower end of the distribution in terms of uh, authority, income, et cetera, or in the public sector, because these data are all for private sector organizations. Uh, the second finding was that although there was a slight decline in the segregation between white men and black men from about 1966 to about 1980, small change, nothing has happened since 1980. It's basically been flat in terms of the desegregation of black men from white men. The desegregation of black women from white men uh, never changed much. It was very high, it stayed very high, slight, slight shift, but basically no change. For white women from white men, there has been somewhat more of a change. Um, it was slow to start, it accelerated a bit through the 70s and 80s, but basically trailed off about 2000 and has not changed much since then. And um, while some white women have entered jobs that previously were held only by white men, it has contributed to a resegregation between white women and black women in terms of the jobs that they hold. But even with the advances that white women have made in the labor force, essentially they are now uh, almost at parity with black men in terms of the proportion working in the same jobs as white men. And um, even if you look only at managerial jobs, uh, again, white men's overrepresentation has been absolutely not changed since the civil rights movement. Women's underrepresentation has declined to some extent, but again, they're still almost but not quite at the level of their representation in the labor force. Um, black men and black women, there's been almost no change in terms of their in, uh, representation in managerial jobs. Professional jobs, um, same story, uh, although white women doing slightly better in terms of their representation, and in craft jobs, essentially same story. Uh, so white men still dominate the best jobs. Um, over the last 50 years, there has been advances for white women. There have been modest changes for black men and black women, but not much for the last 35 years since about 1980. So I think that that's um, something to keep in mind when we're talking about what is happening and why those dynamics haven't changed more than we would but anticipated. that deals with the situation as it is. Yes. It doesn't deal with why that situation yes. has become so. Why do white men still dominate those managerial positions? <laughs> well, I do have an answer for that. Let me give Let me mine very yours. quickly, and then I'll turn okay. it over to others. <laughs> I have a theory. Um, the, the book that is sitting on the table out there that I recently uh, published uh, is really focused on racial inequality, but I think it is related to issues of gender inequality as well. And uh, so my explanation for why there hasn't been more change in terms of equality in general since the passage of the Civil Rights Movement is because all of the focus has been on issues of discrimination and racism or sexism, essentially framing everything in a negative way. What black, what whites, what bad things whites do toward blacks, or what bad things men do toward women. So again, discrimination, racism, sexism. But I think in the post-civil rights period, and it affects women as well as men, uh, uh, racial minorities, um, that most of the action has been in terms of whites helping each other, whites helping other whites, or men helping other men. And those kinds of things are not illegal. Discrimination is illegal, but giving favor to people who are like you is not illegal. And uh, so while some public policy issues have focused on the discrimination against women, there's been very little attention on how 
men keep hiring other men and promoting them and paying them more and so on. And uh, same thing in terms of whites hiring other whites and giving them higher salaries and more authority and better jobs and more promotions and so on. Let me just add to that that I think there is something that everybody continues to neglect. Um, and that's the women that hurt other women. It is a huge issue that I've seen in the, in the workplace, not where I work now, but I'm just saying in general um, with people. I remember in 1998, Gloria Steinem was speaking at Union Square, and you know, I was younger then. And um, I had read Revolution from Within, I had been working at ABC Television, and I was the last person who got to ask a question, and she was launching a new magazine. Um, uh, you know, just kind of about a lot of these different issues and, and women in the workplace and things like that. And I raised my hand and I said, with all due respect, you prepared me in how I could choose to deal with discrimination, sexism, all these things. I feel like I've been given a voice as someone who's going forward in my career. What we haven't addressed is the fact that I think women, in many respects, are our own <coughs> worst enemies at work. I think the fact remains that part of the sexism and things like that is the perception that women are highly emotional, that they get into these other dialogues that have nothing to do with the work at hand. They are more inclined to suck up to men thinking that that will give them an advantage rather than promoting the woman sitting next to them that is equally intelligent and qualified, and until women start embracing other women in the workplace, they're all pitted against each other. So what does that mean? No one's supporting each other so that if a second job comes up, that person's pretty much been tarnished in, in a certain way and a man is free to you know, get on in that spot. I mean, this is just a theory I have from watching and learning and talking to, to people, but I think it's something that people are forgetting to address and is incredibly important. So I think that as women, we do have to take some responsibility as well. Thoughts? <laughs> That's actually very consistent with the, with the research on discrimination, which, uh, I mean, it doesn't necessarily show that women are worse on, uh, or are tougher on other women, but they certainly don't, uh, let's say, help, right? So, so both, or men and women tend to discriminate at the similar rates when it comes to, to, to promotions and things like this. And the reasons for that, I mean, there, there could be many, sure. but it's, it's certainly something that, that you see. You don't see a very strong favoritism between, between women. This is for, the, for top jobs. And that's, that's a very important point to make, that there's been enormous strides in labor force participation and things like this. But it's important to think of the role of, of women in the labor force, not just overall, but thinking of the top, of the top positions where, where the situation looks very different, where there hasn't been as much progress. And uh, coming somewhat to this point about different countries, this can actually vary a lot. So some countries that might look very well on overall statistics, actually for the top jobs might not look so well. And it's not necessarily the same type of policies that would help women get promoted to the top jobs than the ones that would help just women get, go out and, and get some job, right? And uh, so that's something that still need to learn more about. But countries, for example, like the Netherlands has, has great statistics when it comes to labor for participation and so that's driven by a lot of part-time work. It's driven by a lot of work at lower positions. So in top positions, you see a lot of, a lot of discrimination. So it, it, varies, uh, it varies a lot. I thought you were going to go somewhere else in response to the uh, comments. And I'm not sure I agree with you. And I'm not sure the data support what you've just said. I don't have data. Uh, with, <laughs> with a couple caveats. Um, it, it is the case that men and women, whites and blacks, are for the most part similarly affected by the cultural messages and the experiences that we all have. So for example, when, um, uh, when the distribution of resources overlays categorical differences. So for example, most CEOs are white men. Sure. And 
then cognitively, when we see that over and over again, we come to assume cognitively that the people in those kinds of positions deserve to have them. That's called status expectations theory. Um, and it's been demonstrated in a number of different ways. So those kinds of messages um, we all share. And if you look at implicit associations or implicit asso association tests, men and women are so similarly affected by those kinds of messages. But it isn't the case, I think, that um, having the representation of women in, in higher level jobs wouldn't be beneficial in terms of hiring more women in general. In fact, I think that there is some research that showed, at least limited research, that when women, uh, for example, in law firms, if women are represented in top level positions in law firms, then they're more likely to hire other women in those firms compared to men. But where I thought you were going is the, uh, what's called the double bind for women which is that because of these cognitive associations in our heads, we associate being a good manager, being a good leader with being a male. Okay. And so when we think manager, we think male. And so women who enact the behaviors that we think of as being a good manager or a good leader are thought of as not being sufficiently female or feminine in their behaviors and so they're thought of as competent but not nice. And if they enact the more feminine role of being emotional and nice and caring and so on, then they're thought about as being nice but not competent. And that trade-off doesn't exist for men. Men can be both competent and nice. In fact, they are thought of as that way. Um, when they're in top leadership positions, but it isn't the case for women. So if women face that double bind um, and they are having to walk that narrow line, then their behaviors in those roles may be somewhat different than men because women are having to address other kinds of issues about how they're perceived and how they get evaluated. So even they may be subject to those kinds of messages. So if they are in a position to select someone for a job, they also may perceive a woman as being competent but not nice, or nice but not competent, and uh, also uh, feel that they should uh, hire the man because he seems to have the traits the that are package. the whole package, right? But visiting that, though, how do you change that sort of uh, uh, cognitive uh, perception that you have. To me, that sort of change would take more than a generation, it takes several generations of thinking in that, that way. Yes. So yeah, I, it's, I, it's a very difficult situation. Well, I've had that question addressed, particularly with regard to my book on racial inequality a lot. So what do you do if whites help other whites and mm -hmm. it's in, they act with favor toward other whites and it's not really discrimination and racism? Well, the first answer to that is it's not an individual solution. It's not something that you can do simply by changing your own behavior. It's really a collective solution. It's a public policy solution. It's a social movement solution. But short of that, you can also have organizational policies that change if organizations uh, have more accountability for the kinds of decisions that get made. Um, that can make a difference. And then individual people can make a difference. But to do so, they can't just try to be better. Uh, the research tends to show that they have to be explicit about these cultural um, biases that they hold and make them salient. And when they do that, they're less likely to enact the kind of cultural biases that would lead to giving favor to men over women. Um, so those are some of the kinds of things that could be done. Um, One thing that's not emphasized enough, I think, is a lot of this is put in a way that seems to, to be like we should favor women in some way. Um, and Organizations, you can think, they don't want to do that because they might be worried that it will hurt their performance, that they will be just a political correctness type of 
thing. And it should be much more emphasized that that's not the case, that actually, even unknowingly, if in your organization there's favoritism or some sort of discrimination, you are actually hurting your organization because you're, you're not promoting the most qualified people. And that message should be out there so that, let's say, men, which are the ones that hold now the, the top positions, start to worry more about and say, we should actually worry about these associations, these uh, stereotypes that exist about what is a good leader and so, and be much, try to be much more objective about, there's lots of evidence that show that women perform equally, if not better sometimes than men in many, many managerial positions, but the stereotype might still be that the man is the, or the, say, qualities that are associated with men are the ones that you want as leaders, which is not necessarily the case. If we come back to, to the differences between the United States and, for example, we'll take the Nordic countries, aren't there policies in those countries that the United States or women as a whole um, strive towards, for instance, uh, the type of leave they have, the existence of uh, public funded uh, daycare centers, and, Things of that nature. Yes, yeah, certainly those kinds of policies make a huge difference, is that in the Nordic countries and in Europe more so than in the US or England, I guess, uh, having paid childcare for some period of time makes it easier to manage the work family issues um, than the other, uh, you know, they have similar laws about non-discrimination and so on, mm -hmm. but um, give more support for women uh, who might have responsibility for children and families or elder care and so on. Uh, the other thing that I believe the Nordic countries have done, I I'm, I'm, don't know for sure, but I know some European countries, and I think it's the Nordic countries, have mandated a certain proportion of representation on their boards of directors. That's right. They I think 30%. 40. 40%. So the, the assumption there is that if you have representation uh, of women in these positions, that then the policies in the firms will uh, be less likely to be discriminatory or at least will be more likely to be fair. And the research on those kinds of issues, of which there is some emerging, um, tend to show that um, there isn't a direct, clear relationship between that kind of representation and uh, better performance, but at least there is no, uh, no evidence to suggest that that kind of representation leads to lesser performance. So uh, it's and not the, the case the that changes, it's gonna... uh, Yeah, the changes are a little, they're very recent, so you would expect for, for that those at the policies. beginning there might be a shortage of qualified women to fill all these positions because the demand didn't exist. And now as years pass and then more and more women get, you know, there is, this is something that let's say I see in my research or, or what I'm interested in my research is this idea that if you think you're not gonna be promoted, you're not gonna work as hard. To, to get those promotions. So differences that look like, maybe the man looks like he's performing a little bit better, well, it's because he has better incentives to, to, to work hard. Like this idea with the boards, if suddenly you know that 40% of the board will be female, now there's gonna be other, some women that will start to think and say, well, if I want to be a member of the board, I need to do this five things, or, and then get the necessary qualifications. And as this happens, then, my hope or my prediction would be indeed that performance will get better after you've, you, know, you get enough qualified women. But the uh, comment that you made about if you think you're not going to be promoted, you don't work as hard, is anathema to a woman's ability to be promoted. Isn't promotion dependent on performance? So if you don't perform well, then you're not going to get promoted. It's, it's, a, it's a cycle, right? So, and that, that's the problem. This is why it's, it's so hard to break, because uh, if, 
if you think you're not going to get promoted, you're, gonna, you're not going to work as hard, so then you're not going to get promoted because you're not as good as the, yeah. the equivalent male. In, but you cannot the, change only one side. You cannot, you, you need to change both sides for yeah, this but to break this cycle. this conversation makes it sound like promotions and other kinds of choices like this are based on merit, and we know that not that only, is not um, the case that it is centrally based on uh, who knows or supports or is sponsoring whom, uh, and the fact that there are any number of people who might be thought of as qualified, and so it's not the best person, it's the one who has the right connections, the right people, the right place in the right time, and in general, if white men are in the decision-making positions, they will tend to hire other white men or promote them or give them raises and so on. And that's, um, that's true actually throughout the labor force, not just at the top, and uh, it's very consequential. Mm -hmm. um, let me give you an example that uh, was very interesting to me. About a year and a half ago, I was invited to attend a conference that was sponsored by a major company, Fortune 100 company, that wanted to have business school faculty um, do a better job of admitting and training and graduating minority students because they wanted to be able to hire them and they thought if they could influence the faculty they would do a better job with the students. So the CEO of this company came to this little conference of about 30 people and gave an impassioned plea about the uh, importance of diversity to the survival of his firm. He said that, like many firms, 75% of their profits and the growth of the company was coming from outside the United States. He said that people had to learn to work with people whose names they couldn't pronounce, and that in general, that the firm would not survive if middle management didn't become more representative of the world, and so on. Um, and so in this discussion, I posed to him the issue about implicit bias that so many people have heard about, about unconscious bias, the fact that we have these cognitive messages in our heads. He knew all about that. He had brought one of the key researchers from Harvard in to talk to the top management of the firm. He, he, he knew all about trying to get rid of implicit bias. And yet at dinner that night, I learned from one of the HR directors that that firm rewarded people in the company who recommended people they later hired. So he was supposedly wanted to increase the diversity of middle management, but middle management was disproportionately white men. And so if they recommended people, it was going to be other white men. And so his whole framework about bias was bias against. He wanted to get rid of the bias against people and gave no attention to the fact that in his firm, continually, there was bias for whites hiring other whites. And so he thought the survival of his firm depended on having a more diverse labor force, and yet they had policies in this firm which were Please. reproducing the existing Please, labor force. If I can also go back to the comment about a woman who perceives rightly or wrongly that someone, a male, white male, black male even, just a male, is going to be promoted so they kind of just laissez, become laissez-faire. I, I have to disagree. I feel like there are a lot of women that work even harder when they see that situation. I feel like that's been our MO, is that we have to, to prove ourselves and everything else, but we're still not getting that job or that managerial position or that CEO level. Um, you know, I, I, I think that it's a real problem when people perceive women as giving up or just going to accept the status quo because I, I really don't know any woman that does that um, on any level um, willingly. There's a difference in how they've been raised or the values or their own self-esteem and I think self-esteem does play an immense role in this as well. I think in those situations that you're talking about, a lot of women, because they've either been rejected or they feel like they've been passed up or, or whatever, their self-esteem becomes smaller and smaller, and so they don't demand what they deserve. 
And I don't think that's addressed. Men don't seem to engage in these same types of, of dialogues, at least in, in the people that I've observed. If anything, their ego is often inflated. Um, it's true. And um, so they don't, they don't second guess themselves all the time. I mean, I, I, I can speak when, at least in my line of work, Women are always coming back and kind of second guessing, like, is that right? Da, da, da. You know, it's, it's like this perfectionist thing, and men are just kind of like, it is what it is, let's move on, what's the next witness? You know, it's, it's like this thing, and I think some of that is based on how we're groomed to, to think about ourselves as women. And um, I also want to get back to the point, I think you made an excellent, excellent observation. I'm just curious how you all would view yourselves in your work careers. Are you the nice, incompetent one? Or are you the one who's, um, can I swear? <laughs> Bitch from hell, but like gets it done. Like, you know, um, I, I'm just curious. And, yeah. and where has that gone for you? Because I can say for me, I've grown. I used to start out in pantsuits and things like that, being kind of what I perceived, you know, um, was the right track, and then I said, you know what, I'm a woman, and like, I'm gonna wear makeup, and I'm gonna, you know, wear heels, um, and I'm, I'm gonna, you know, not wear hose sometimes in court, and I'm gonna wear pink, I'm gonna wear blue, I'm gonna be who I am. And I've seen how that's borne out for me. I'm just curious if either one of you has ever identified with one of those. I, I just want to uh, raise a point uh, about something you said. Sure. That we all know that you're not promoted because of what you do, it's who you know. and that, That's generalizing, though, because there are situations, well, there are a lot of situations, and there are careers. For instance, in science, promotion depends on what you have achieved, your ability to do it, good or bad, positive or negative. And it doesn't depend at all on who you might know in the department. And I know that because we have traveled so much. And I have gone to various institutes, oftentimes not knowing anyone at all. And it's only on a CV that your position and your salary is estimated. It doesn't depend on who you know or uh, well, that, that's, that's because a wonderful, you don't know. Uh, that's a wonderful setup for, <laughs> for my response because, of course, uh, a lot of the research I've done are on scientists and engineers. And uh, my research does not show what you have just said. Um, I did a study of uh, 24 major multi-billion dollar U.S. companies in different parts of the country with 3,200 scientists and engineers and we had data on their career experiences, and then we also had the evaluation of their managers. And in the analyses that we did, um, we looked at two different kinds of outcomes. One was their evaluation as being innovative, which is a key thing for scientists mm -hmm. and engineers, and the other thing was the, their evaluation um, as promotable into management. And among other factors, controlling for all the kinds of things that you think you should control for, um, we looked at their access to favorable work experiences, which in science and engineering is being able to choose your own work as opposed to having someone assign it to you. And we found in that analysis that US-born white men were more likely than other groups to be able to choose their own work, what's called access to technical control, and then over and above their access to these favorable work experiences, they also got higher evaluations on innovativeness and higher evaluations on promoted, promotability into management, net of patents, net of publications, net of their education, net of their years of experience. So essentially, US-born white men were getting the benefit of the doubt, and they were getting favorable experiences that affected their evaluation as being more qualified and then also more likely to be promoted into management. So uh, even in science and engineering where you think that there's a very hard and fast kind of uh, measurement of merit, uh, it, there simply isn't. 
And certainly in any university, that is quite evident. You can take anyone's uh, qualifications, and they can be interpreted in a number of different ways. Uh, I've been on the faculty for, I think, about 40 years now. I've been tenured for a long time, sat on many, many personnel committees. And the bar gets raised or lowered depending on who the candidate is and who in the room wants to be favorable toward that person. And you can fight against it, and you can raise all kinds of questions about merit. But you, know, you can't finesse zero. If the person has done nothing, then you can't do much. But no one, for the most part, is in that situation. Everyone has done something. And then, depending on who's friends with whom, the case can get presented as the best thing since sliced bread, or it can be sort of just not good enough. Uh, you know, needs to go somewhere else because isn't doesn't meet our standards. Well, I, I suppose the difference is the type of science that you're in, you're involved in. Because I was in biological science, and um, the fact that I never aspired to a management role. In fact. I couldn't because we moved so much. But certainly my uh, CV, or curriculum vitae, made a difference in the papers I'd published and the research that I had done did um, contribute towards the position that I was able to get. No, that's, so. that's true for everyone. Certainly patents and publications had a positive effect, but the issue is net of that, controlling for that, U.S. white men still got the benefit of the doubt, and they got favorable yeah. assignments. Well, I can see that yeah. might be the outcome. And, and my data and included, you know, electronic and biology and uh, chemistry and every type of science, so it was not limited to a certain field. Did you yeah. ever do one in law? Uh, I, I didn't do the work in law, but there are lots and lots of research yeah. on lawyers, and they, they tend to show the same thing. Really? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Oh. One, I think what, one issue to, to think about here is, uh, is like to think, uh, yeah, we, generally we, we tend to separate and say, well, output is really publications and patents. And, For but, scientists and engineers. But if you really think about output, it, it, it's not just those two things, but it's also no, but networking. That's what... and, and that's like part of, of your production of not just science, but in, in, many, yeah. in many other positions. And there we see some clear differences. See the type of networks that say that white males might have and that women might have. But um, part of that, in, in a way, I think it's, it's uh, is the way they go about building their network. I mean, it's not like, it, it's not determined that, the, that the, the social networks are the way they are. You can work on networking, and that's where you see Men tend to network more than the women do. Yeah, women don't have time to network. They're they might not. Yes, uh, working full time and taking care of families and right. Exactly okay. right. Yeah. And and those differences, let's say, are are but but that's where I think that if there's a change of incentives at the top, the incentive to network might also change, and then you might, if some cultural changes, like the, the man takes care of the kids at home, you have more time, you can start networking, and then some of these differences might, might go away. Yeah, let me mention that just uh, these issues about how you evaluate competence and whether one can do it on objective criteria or not really uh, was underlined for me this year, because as vice dean for faculty and research, I'm in charge of personnel issues, so I have to oversee all the tenure and promotion decisions. And we had this year a ca two cases in the same department, one white male, one woman, who happened to be European-born, uh, who were both coming up for promotion. And our appointments and promotions committee raved about him and said, you know, this is such a clear <coughs> case of someone who deserves promotion. <coughs> and on her case, there was um, uh, they're saying, you know, not quite enough, she's not really ready, etc. They both had ex almost identical citations. They had almost the same number of uh, uh, published papers in good journals. If anything, I think hers were, were more over her career. Uh, she was on a major editorial board. He was on an editorial board of a journal no one had ever heard of. 
And yet this committee represented his editorial board membership as being on a journal which was not the one he was actually on. They simply substituted the name of a top journal instead of the one that actually he was on. And, you know, this kind of stuff happens all the time. And if you don't have people who are paying attention to how these criteria get weighted and evaluated, then you will reproduce these kinds of inequalities. What did you do? What did you do? I, <laughs> I made, sh first of all, I sent the report back to the Appointments and Promotions Committee and said, you don't have the right name in the journal here. And then I, uh, because as vice dean, I got to write the dean's report. Of course, I you know, tried to write an equitable case. Now, as it turns out, he has been promoted. We're still waiting to hear about her, so. <laughs> Can we get back to networking? Because I think there is a difference, networking as a woman and networking as a man. There's a, no matter what, if you're in a room full of people in the industry or whatever, and as a woman, you approach a man who's in power, there is a observation by people. There's a sexual component to it. There's all these other pressures and, and things that go into it versus the guys hanging out in the back and being the guys. And I think a lot of times I've heard of situations where men feel very uncomfortable just, you know, either having that dinner or networking or having that follow-up conversation or whatever. And I think that in some sense that does hold women back in a way. You disagree, but um, I, well, it could also work the other way. Let's face it, it could go either way, but the, the whole point is, is that networking, I think, is different for men and women and how you go about that and um, how it's perceived and everything else. And I also think that um, in science, maybe networking isn't everything and perception isn't everything, but at least in the industries I've been in, I would say that's 50%. Um, everybody's, you know, at different levels, obviously, it's going to be behind, you know, between, you know, two different people of kind of the same level. But um, the perception, and if this is someone that you can hang out with and go have a drink with after work, and all these other dynamics play a huge part, not not in what you're delivering. It's extremely political. Yeah, again, the research shows exactly what you're saying that networking is not the same for men and women, and not the same for whites and non-whites. Great. Essentially, women and non-whites have to borrow social capital from white men yes. uh, in order to do as well. But, um, the, and it's also, there are also some research to show that the, it, it is more difficult to have the kind of mentoring relationship between a female subordinate and a male uh, superior because of this romance. It yes. looks like a date as yes. opposed to a professional relationship. Yes, and then all your uh, colleagues are looking at it is that She's getting ahead, not because she has merit and credence, but because of favors of right. favoritism. Yeah. And so it's very difficult yeah. to walk that balance. Yes. Which is partly why it's so important to have representation of women in the top level decision making jobs as well, because it helps mitigate that issue to some extent. Correct. Um, one of the key things that I found in the research that I did for my book, which included uh, detailed job histories for whites in several different parts of the country between t ages of 25 and 55, I found that 70% of the jobs that people got over their lifetimes was because they got help from somebody, because they got information other people didn't have, they had influence used on their behalf, or they had someone who actually could offer them a job or an opportunity. So 70% of the time, people had that kind of help. And the jobs where you didn't have the help was, as one of my interviewees said, when one job is as bad as another, you don't have to draw on social capital to get a job because you know, anybody can get it. But um, when I ask the people that I interviewed, so what do you think most contributed to your having the kind of life you have now? They all said, because I worked hard, because I was smart, because I got an education, because I did whatever. So they, although they actively drew from this kind of social connections, they all individualized their success and thought they did it on their own. I think that's another thing that's important, is that women want to do it on their own. I mean, I know I was in an industry where my family, um, well, after the fact, got very connected. 
quit that job, went to law school, and went where no one in my family is. And I think that that's very important in terms of knowing, and I'm not saying that I didn't have other things in my favor. I mean, I was well educated. I came from a nice family. You know, I, I had other things going for me, but I think that for women to get forward, they need to believe in themselves and know why they got there. There are plenty of women that I have heard from that are like, well, the only reason I got it, it was because my uncles, you know, whatever, that never really kind of move forward or know their own worth or anything else because they just kind of relied on those wings. I mean, I think that's um, important for women to work on themselves. I mean, I do think that there is a lot of work for women to do on themselves as well. And there are conversations that we need to be having with each other and supporting each other. And this goes back to my theory that nobody else really believes. But I, I think that there is a great resource um, in, the, in, the, in the workplace of women sharing with women and empowering other women and looking at you know, the intelligence and the beauty and the, and, and the potential and being happy for other women. I think that is counterintuitive to most women. Most women are in a competitive, they feel like it's them against someone else. I know you disagree. I am. Um, <laughs> don't, don't you? Research on this, you're sounding yeah. Okay. Very okay. Funny. Now I understand. Okay. Well, let, I, let, let me support your comment for a minute. Well, she can then. support and research. Let me just say, I'm not a research person. Yeah. I, I prosecute cases. I deal yeah. with people who kill people. Like, I'm a homicide. I have no research. But I have everyday experience, not as much as many people, not as much. But I also make the observations in the comments that I think a lot of people feel that nobody does make and nobody bothers to research. This is a very uncomfortable area. Women don't want to hear. They want to believe that women, you know, we're the victims. We need to be empowered. And OK, no, no, no. But I'm saying I hear this a lot, that we're somehow um, being repressed or this, whether it be sex, all of that is true, but there is a great potential for women to get together and really embrace each other. I'm sorry, I actually asked a bunch of people at work um, this for a couple of years, I'm like, what is the deal? What is the deal in this office? Why can't we say, um, instead of the caddy remark, can you believe this, can you believe that, can you believe the man she's networking with, can you believe, all of that is just, it, it contributing to the fact that we're not uplifting each other. And I, 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 I think it's a real problem that needs to be yeah. equally addressed. I, I, so let me say, first of all, that I don't think in general that your observation is correct. That in general, I think the more representation of women in decision-making positions, the better off other women in the organization will be. And that while there may be the occasional Caddy remark, I don't think that that's general representation of what happens when women enter the labor force. But the place where there is some support for what you are observing um, can be found, for example, in work that Rosabeth Moss Cantor, who's currently at Harvard, did years ago, where she was um, looking at the structure of women's jobs compared to the structure of men's jobs. And she observed several different kinds of things. First of all, that women were more likely to be in jobs that had access to fewer resources than the jobs that men had. And when you have access to fewer resources, then you might hoard them and be less likely That's to share. That's the government. Okay. Right. And then the second thing she observed was that men's jobs were likely to be uh, in the types of jobs that had ladders to better jobs whereas women's jobs were more likely to be in ladders that didn't go anywhere. <coughs> and so men had more opportunity and had links to those opportunities, whereas women's jobs did not. And then she also looked at the observation of the, when women were in a minority, that certain kinds of things happened in terms of how people uh, address them, like particularly if there's only a very small proportion of women in the, that work setting. And she observed that particularly when there was a small group of women and it seemed that only a few women could get ahead, then under those circumstances, each woman might think that they're competing with the other one because only one will get the job. Right. It wasn't a general experience. It's mostly men, but occasionally a woman gets through and I'm going to be the one to do it. Right. So under those kinds of circumstances, you may observe the kind of behavior that you're talking about, but I don't think it's a general um, 
experience when you're talking about broader representation but in the labor force. But it's equally valid because that's the working environment that, that, that you would see. I've always experienced right. and that many women experience. And I don't want to not have a voice or not have a way to express that because I'm in a particular area right. and I'm not the general. I guarantee you I'll never be in the general. <laughs> but, you know, like, it, yeah. it's just, it's, it's something that I think but, but, even, but even in law firms, the, there's some but research by firm, Robin right. Ely uh, from Harvard who, who looked at law firms and found that when there were more women partners, then there's more chance that a woman will be hired in that firm uh, compared to when there are no women partners, even with women in lower level positions, right. then I would agree there'll be that. different dynamics. The but don't you that, think it, it is a combination of things that result in a woman in not maybe not general but certainly specifically in women getting ahead that you do need people at some stage you may not realize it overtly as someone helping you and then the woman herself has to have a devotion or a passion for a particular av avocation so it's a combination of someone who wants to do something and also someone who may want to help. And most times women, well, f in my own case, it's been men who've helped me get along. So that it, it doesn't necessarily need to be the one thing or the other. Well, again, most um, women will be helped by men because men are the decision makers disproportionately. Mm -hmm. But with women in positions of decision making, they are probably more likely to recognize that and call to uh, attention the issues of women's competence as well. And uh, women are likely to do well. But, um, but that's the, the, the problem of, of really telling apart that, that effect it's, it's very hard, right? And because law firms, let's say, that have more women at the, at the top are also law firms where the men are different from the m law firms where there's only men at the top. So yeah, it could be an effect for, from, from both. Right, right, yeah. Right. Right. What is the reason for the implicit bias? Because I think that Well, again, the... Well, not, not just history. I think that you could be a little more specific. Again, there's... Um, Lots of different ways that one could address it, but the one that I think makes the most sense is, again, from uh, what's called status construction theory or status expectations theory, that finds that when resources are distributed unequally and overlaid with categorical differences among people, like men versus women, whites versus blacks, and so on. And so when you observe men always in positions that have more authority, more income, more training, more education, et cetera, uh, or whites in those kinds of positions, then you come to assume that the people with the resources are the ones who are both competent and worthy. And this sort of research, let me just say, because it sounds like it's just you know, uh, describing something that isn't real, the research was, has not been done on men versus women or uh, blacks versus whites. It's done on artificially constructed groups, artificially constructed categories. Like people might be called overestimators and underestimators, or people that like Paul Clay versus people that like Picasso. So the, this uh, social psychological research creates these distinctions and then give the people with these different distinctions different amounts of resources. And then they evaluate how they evaluate each other. And again, they find the people with the most resources are the ones that are assumed to be more competent, to be more uh, worthy, to get the benefit of the doubt, and so on and so forth. So even without real groups, you just artificially create the groups, you have this cognitive outcome. Because we have a tendency to want to think whatever is is right. And therefore, if those people are in charge, it's because they should be in charge. And, and again, we do that to ourselves. And, there's the, and that effect is multiplied by then, let's say, young women that are thinking of a career. If they never see a woman in, say, in engineering, they might assume that, men or are they implicitly, math, right. they might think that men are better at that. 
right. even though it's not true. Yeah. And, and then, again, they don't get the proper training. And then later on, yeah, they won't be qualified for those yeah. jobs. And there so is variation what across you need is, countries. Is better models? Uh, that, 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 that if you have a good model, let's say you have a mother who is working and successful, that that will lead you also to, as a woman, to work and become successful? The is research does show that, yes. Women, the research shows that women need to see other women in areas, and that two things. Women need to see women in other areas so they have role models. Women in elementary school are being discouraged from going into math and sciences, okay? So Israel, which is the most techie country in the world, which is a nice conference on it, and they did, and they had a representative from Israel, a male or female, running companies. And they were saying that in Israel, they didn't have enough women role models, and that women need, not only in Israel, but women need to see role models. If you don't see role models, you don't see how you do it. You don't see ways of doing it. Women do mentor. Oh, no, 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 I agree. I have a mother who's still working even though she should have retired a long time ago. She'll work to the day she dies. I have incredible women influences. At work, I gravitate towards women mentors and everything like that. But uh, Most of the professional organizations that I belong to are very male The only way some of us have counted that as, as a group of women, we have gotten together. Yes. We have been very helpful with each other. Yes. We started a separate women's group. Wonderful. Women's, we don't say group. Okay. Women's professional group that's partnered with the other group. And we give good, a woman will talk about her new idea. We will right. give input. Most of us are in the same profession. I'm in the same profession with all these women. Mm -hmm. I'm not competing. Right. I have enough. Uh, uh, so you really have to, you, you're not going to get the support from the guys in the male dominated professional organization. I'm not going to change that culture. I can create another culture. Right. And I guess in my job, <laughs> that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> and I, and I've, I've had these discussions over the years. In a, I, I'm in a very different kind of place, but I've been in that different place in three different careers. So I, at least in my experience, there are certain types of jobs where you know, it's hard to get the women to get on the same page. I had an office many years ago in Staten Island. Mm. And, I, and we had to go to social functions. And I was told, and I quote, in Staten Island, women don't talk to men. Men come up to talk to women. So what I had to do was to work hard and letting people know that I was very friendly. We would talk to everybody, but it was strictly business. It was strictly business. It was not men. If I had to have lunch with a guy or meet them, lunch, lunch. And then I made an effort to meet the women, the wives, so that the wives sure. would get to know me and see. Oh, I don't understand. Is the solution that women have to get together and create groups to counter men? Is that what the solution is? Well, it, it's not uh, the solution. Yes. There are many solutions. Again, solutions include collective behavior, collective actions, social movements, public policy, uh, organizational policies, and individual behavior. Uh, there is some uh, controversy, if you will, in terms of women in leadership roles. Should women simply have leadership development courses, or should they have courses that are specifically for women in leadership? And the research tends to show that both of those things help. So it, that you need uh, different kinds of social support, for example. You need some people who will be instrumentally helpful, who are going to help you with job opportunities and with knowledge about certain kinds of things happening in the profession. And then you also need social support. You need someone to validate your experience who is going to help you understand that it's not you that it's structurally related to factors like how women get treated versus how men get treated. Uh, I mean, one of the famous examples of that was the study of uh, the scientist at MIT, is that one of the women, and I think she was in biology, I'm trying to remember, um, just got fed up one day with 
uh, feeling somehow she wasn't getting the resources that she wanted. And so she went around, she measured, physically measured everybody's office. And then she, to see how many square feet each of the scientists had in her area. And she found the women had less square feet of office space than the men. And she got together with um, other women scientists at MIT, and they began to talk among themselves about, well, what's happening to you and what's happening to you? And they were finding out they were having very common experiences, which they didn't know because there was only one of them in each department, right? You know, very small representation. Right. And then their efforts to put together some data to show that, in fact, they weren't being treated the same way the men were was facilitated by the fact that Lottie Balin happened to be president of the faculty senate at that time, who was someone who had done research on these kinds of issues. And therefore, she kind of fostered the attention to their concerns. And then it went to the president of the university, who then said, well, you know, you're right. We haven't been treating women the same. And they started making some changes. So that suggests you know, individuals doing things, groups offering social support, having the right people in decision-making power who can influence decisions. And you know, at the right time, it happened to be at MIT when they had the resources, I guess, to make some changes. And then it spread across the country. It, somebody made, Lottie, I think, made sure it got into the New York Times. And then it was pub picked up by all kinds of um, you know, other media uh, publications, and then other universities started saying, well, maybe we should look at you know, what's happening to our women scientists and so on. So you know, it didn't change everything, but it had an impact. But ultimately, to really reach parity, let's say, in, in talk, the men have to be on board. Otherwise, it's, it's just not going to happen, right? And, and coming down to issues about perception of, of the jobs and family issues, uh, if men don't pick up the taking care of the kids, uh, it, it would be impossible for, for women to be in this really competitive profession. So it, well, it would... men aren't taking care of the kids. Other women are taking care of the kids for the most part. Right, right but that's what I mean. That's what so I mean. They yeah. need to fully participate. Eventually, you, you need to get the men on board. Uh, also, because what you don't want, I think it's a mistake, is, is to try to fix it by making women look like men. And to me, that's a little self-defeating, because then it's, it's, it's just going to destroy the, the diversity and, and the good things of having both men and women in, in top positions is that they are different. They think different. Otherwise, we're just, we, we will have parity, maybe at, at some point, but they'll be all acting like men. And that's not necessarily a good thing, like to go back to some of your points, men tend to be overconfident. That's not good. I mean, it might promote them in their careers, but they're that making the, the wrong decisions. Use, yes. <laughs> it's, it's pretend, but uh, I'll open it up for questions. OK. You have a comment and a question. On the question of uh, science, uh, there was a panel discussion here a couple of weeks ago on, that, on women in science. And they mentioned studies where papers were submitted to journals or for grants. And they had women's names or men's names on the paper. And there was clear discrimination in terms of just what names were on the paper. Wow. Um, also, my question has to do with the, how much does the fact that, you know, as was mentioned, that the responsibility for having and raising children aren't, isn't shared equally uh, responsible for um, the problems. And uh, I wonder, I've read that if you look at single women without children, that their salaries are the same as men. There isn't discrimination. Is that true or not? No, no, no. no What's the difference? True. How much is it? Is it 23% you know, the they always? I, I, I don't remember the exact data, but at every point of comparison, you will still find that when you control for full-time work, weeks worked, type of job, type of occupation, and so on, uh, that men are going to make more. 
and that's true whether you're talking about single women or women with children, it tends to be the case that for each additional child, women pay a penalty in terms of salary and such in the workforce. Uh, but even single women uh, tend to be um, disadvantaged compared to men. Even male nurses make more money than female nurses and so on. So even in overwhelmingly female-dominated positions, men still benefit. But not uh, Yes. And, uh, you know, that, that there, there was some effort to say that, you know, between the ages of 25 and something or other, then, then there was parity. But it, 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 that's a very narrow thing, and, and the gap widens over time. But, but not to say that it's not a very important component. Uh, it is not a very important component that the gap, it's true that, there, that there's still a gap once you account for these things, but these things account for a lot of the gap, of, of the gap Well, that job exists, segregation right? accounts for the most, and then years of experience, and then, uh, and then the evaluation of women's work versus men's work, and so on. I was going to mention, uh, this lady mentioned Abramson. Uh, the big case now at the New York Times is really serious to look at because we're talking about salaries of 500 something thousand dollars and over. Uh, Salzberger actually hired this person himself. This is the person he fired. And she'd been with this paper for many, many years and many important managerial positions. He was upset because she realized and did her research about how much the former person in her CEO position got, and when she was the managerial position, lower one, how much money she was, she was losing. And also, she had, in her job description and her responsibilities, the right to put a new person on as a co-manager or take somebody off. The judgment is not about the work. The judgment is about brusque or indiscriminate or insensitive or something like that. They don't use that with men when they're making the decisions. So when she came to the boss's office with an attorney, he was in shock. How did she dare come to him with an attorney? Why did she talk to him? Because she did her homework. And when they responded, I don't know if you read this, this whole case, when they responded, <clears throat> the answer was, you're not making $75,000 less. We, when the original salary we offered you was 505, and then when you said this one was getting 595, we gave you 5, 535, and you agreed because we gave you perks. And they made, they showed how all these perks were equal to the men's salary that was a straight salary. Maybe he got the perks too, I don't know. But the point is, it was the chutzpah of her coming to his office with a lawyer, having the research, having the evidence, having the facts, and saying, this is not equal. And she was fired. Now that was the big report. You can look at it in, in, um, on your internet and see a lot of different responses to this, but this is a case to watch because it's a matter of turf. You mentioned uh, floor space. That's not, that's not just segregated to women. Architects have been told, top-down hierarchy, the CEO will get this, this one will get that, this one will have a window, this chair will be higher than this one, so when he sits in, the guy is lower. It's very psychological. We're in a psychological institute. There are a lot of games that were written. There's a book from Harvard, you might remember, uh, Games Mother, the game that they never told us to play. Right. Games Mother we, never taught We yet. don't have the bag of tools. We should have them by now. I mean, for Dan did her book a long time ago. No, these books are all old books. The problem is the culture. No, I'm just saying the problem is the culture. The women who were younger don't understand the struggle that was done for them. They take it for granted, and we don't have the same force. So the women that you want to sit around and say, oh, I don't need that. I don't need that. That's very good for the men. It's not good for the women. Right. The women need to stay together, and they have to help each other on every single level. To, you have to, share to reinforce that particular case, there's been some studies of women on Wall Street, and again, it's exactly the same thing. 
Women may be making a million dollars, but they're not making three. And so in every point where there's a comparison, men end up making more. Uh, there was recently a study that was released about a year or so ago by Catalyst, which is you know, uh, the research organization that studies women in the workforce, particularly in management and boards of directors, in which they looked at, I think it was 4,000 MBAs from all kinds of universities from different parts of the world, and they looked at uh, you know, controlling for issues of childcare and full-time work and type of job and so on, that women start out in their very first job making less, and then it just grows over the career. And we're talking about people with MBAs, you know, the same. I just lost it. Actually, the, the gap is bigger at the top, right? So it's, yeah, it, it's, it grows over time, particularly yeah. after 10 years. Th that brings up a point. What, um, what impact does the, the equal pay law, which was passed in the um, 1963, early 90s, 19, uh, because that seems to be ignored throughout the whole country. So what, what does it mean? Anything? That, that kind of legislation, like, like the Civil Rights Act, I mean, like the Civil Rights Act, it depends on someone bringing a lawsuit. Yep. It depends on showing that people are in similarly situated positions and that they have similar kinds of qualifications, et cetera. It's very hard to use that kind of law to lead to equitable outcomes and for the most part, it's again, it's you difficult. know, the data that I talked about for the Civil Rights Act, we assume because the legislation is there, the outcomes will follow. That simply is not the case. Well, does that mean that the law needs to be more specific? I mean, how else? That's exactly what groups are now uh, lobbying for, an Equal Pay Act. But there is already that one in place. Well, what's so how are they going to change it? What they're, they're lobbying for currently has to do with the right to have the knowledge of the... It's the exposure public. Like in, in government, obviously, everything of us is public record. Yes. I like that because I know that the guy sitting next to me is my, you know, that's good. <laughs> but you don't have that in most professions. And I, I think part of the problem, and I, I hate feeling like a woman, I'm a bargaining chip. It's almost as like you get the promotion, women get so excited they, don't, they forget to ask, well, wait a second. You know, I feel so honored. I'm so, oh my gosh, me? Okay, great. This is so great. And then they forget to do the, the research and, and they, then they don't have the chutzpah and everything else. I really do believe all of these salaries and, and last, it's just like a house that gets sold. You know how much it sold for the last time. So what's the job for, you know, going out? I deserve that. And it's a question that should be asked. And we shouldn't be yeah. afraid to ask it. We shouldn't be so taken aback by the fact that we've been selected. Yeah. Women don't negotiate, they don't ask. Well, negotiate. If they do ask, they get yes. less. And they're and afraid if... <laughs> that they're not, and I think because we've been taught this way, we're afraid that all of a sudden people we're gonna look, like us. They're, we're not gonna look like we're appreciative. But hopefully you would go back to your professional organizations and then start talking to some of the older women and get yes. them mentoring in that. Yes. And they will be helpful so that each one goes back. So I deal right. with people in my field and I talk to them about presentation and doing seminar and asking for money. And hopefully your law profession, you would go to some people and they would mentor you and say, all right, this is what you have to do. You know, this, the problem is that you're talking there and we can't record it. So if you want to say something, you have to talk to me. Yes, right. Oh, I forgot to say something. Yes. There are certain areas that have protected women that can't have gender or sexism or ageism that much as anything else. And that are, those are places where you have unions. Like mm. in the theater, you have yes. a part. You have six women come up for the part. One gets the part. It has nothing to do with... It's her talent, her reading, or whatever, and the guy gets the guy's part. But there's and less they have women parts. After and equity and, and, and all these other unions and the health benefits and stuff has Awful. nothing to do with anything else. They had to break through the racism part of it for Latinos and blacks and so on, but they, they, they did work through it. They had little clutches and people worked together. Then you have also uh, in, in academia, you have all this business of publish or perish and all that stuff, but it, it works for the men the same as the women, 
but it's a little harder for the women because even if they're senior, the men get into the men's bathroom and they have all these discussions. By the time you're getting into the meeting, the meeting took place in the bathroom. You're just, you're just hearing the results. So very hip women who are VPs in different areas, in corporate areas, have I figured out. Women were talking about it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. The men were the men's bathroom made the decisions. Then came into the, bar, the meeting. The, but the decisions were already made. That's what the people They come in at 8 o'clock in the morning. There are showers in the men's bathroom. There are no showers in the women's bathroom. They come in at the, you know. So the, the meeting takes place there, and they get, they get there, and they make their decision as though it's brand new. But there are some women who already are too smart and know this because they read some of those books from way back. Now, so one we have to, one have to go on okay, one example, okay, one, one, last one, one last one, one, one example of one woman who took it on, straight on. She had a big budget and had a lot of airline tickets that she used. And she called up and wanted a VP, uh, she wanted her, her um, Superior. Her, uh, she wanted the same ticket that they had for the men VPs because she was flying all over Europe and the United States and so on. And she had to bring these people with her and set up lectures. <coughs> so they said, oh, we can't. She said, why not? I'm not a vice president in charge of dishwasher. I run the advertising department. What do you mean? Why not? You wouldn't give it. She said, you have three minutes to do it before I call up Gloria Steinem, Harriet Van Horn, and, and all these famous people of those days, Dorothy Kilgallen, and I'm not using your airline, and I'm sending these back. Guess what? She got it. She said, I don't need cigars. I don't need first class. I want you to hold the plane for me if I'm late the way you do it for the guys. Oh, I love that. Apropos. Okay. I, can, I, I am such a case in point. You can do all the statistics on me. My brother told the family that when he was 16 years old, he went, there was an ad for, um, you can fly anywhere for $25, and, uh, and if, they're if the plane is full, we'll give you your own plane. I don't remember this. He said he went to LaGuardia Airport, he was 16, he waited for four hours till the plane was full, and then he was the next one, and he said, I want my own plane. I want you to know my brother's a very, very successful man. It starts when you're little. It has to do with your self-image. And Thank mommy, you. darling, mommy said to me, I'll never forget this. Your brother needs the bigger room. He has more stuff. I'd like to know what that stuff is. I want some of that stuff. Fortunately, you know, I, I realized at a very young age I've got stuff too. It may not be in a penis. It's maybe up here. <laughs> My stuff is up here. And I'm going to use it. And I made damn sure I married a man who respected yes. my head. And I, I told Freddie, Freddie is my boss. I work for Freddie. He's an artist. I said, Freddie, everything in my life is a negotiation. I negotiate for a cup of coffee. I want that coffee, I want it the way I want it. Harry said to me, and I, I write, that's what I do, unpublished. If you weren't such a good goddamn writer, I would have made you stay as a teacher. And I left teaching 30 years ago to write for the drawer. If you know what that means, in Russia, people who are writing controversial stuff don't get published. They write for the drawer. I'm your writer for the drawer. Hi, my name is Miriam Stern. I'm also an attorney, so I'm not a researcher, but I have a lot of anecdotal uh, feelings about some of the things said. You have to hold uh, the mic close to oh, your mouth. Okay. Uh, Miriam Stern, attorney. So I'm not a researcher. I have anecdotal feelings about some of the things said, and Professor Didamas, so I thank you so much for all the research that you mentioned today, and I so agree with everything, feeling it. Um, I just want to comment about what was said about theater, because I'm an entertainment lawyer, also an adjunct professor at several universities here in the city, 
teaching business law and law to filmmakers. There is tremendous prejudice in the theater industry. There are hardly any female writers that are being produced. There are hardly any female directors that are being hired. You can count them on one hand. Same in the film industry. And in terms of academia, I totally agree with everything you've said. And again, anecdotally, as a lawyer, I've read that 2% of females ever make partner. So there are no females up there to support other females. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm Fran Dillon. Um, I wanted to go back to implicit bias. Um, I had an experience this morning with a visiting uh, transplant surgeon. She, she uh, was, I guess, one of 40 who were here in New York at the uh, New York Academy of Medicine. And uh, I guess at the opening meeting, she was um, sitting at a table with other surgeons and they were introducing the people at the table and they came to her and said she's the coordinator and um, she was shocked of course but she's one of the few I think transplant surgeons in the country um, so I was interested in different sectors what's happening in different sector sectors particularly medicine but I said to her, what did you say? And she said, well, I said, I'm a surgeon. And, and after that, she said, I didn't say anything else. Um, so I just wonder about the language to deal with that implicit bias. Because I think women don't have the language to deal with it. And um, she, you know, she really needed that. She's in her 40s. And she will go to meetings over and over again like this. And so I'd love your comment. Right. Well, I think, again, any time one is an only in, in a profession or in a group, you're going to have these experiences over and over again because people will form prototypes in their head about who should be in this kind of profession. And it will be like those that are in the majority. Um, but let me mention two things that I think uh, we haven't addressed yet and that might be useful for the conversation. One is that while all of the kinds of things that we've been discussing are true in terms of the research that has looked at the issues, uh, women get paid less, women are less likely to be in positions of authority, women are less likely to be taken seriously, and so on. But some women do make it. And that's one of the things that we do need to keep in mind. Alice Eagley and I think Linda Carley did a book called The Labyrinth of Leadership, where they argued that we have the wrong imagery to talk about the glass ceiling and somehow think that everything's just fine until women get to the top and then they get stopped because they argue that these kinds of things take place at every point along the way. But it isn't simply um, a straight shot that when women run into obstacles, they can go around them. They can find another pathway. And that's why they called it the labyrinth of leadership, that there are ways to uh, manage to overcome the obstacles despite discrimination, despite the favoritism that, that uh, men enjoy. Um, and part of that is persistence. Part of it is good luck. Part of it is skill. Um, but knowing that there are examples of people who have somehow done it against the odds, I think, is something to uh, be sure that we remember and to be encouraged by. One of the uh, things, I think, along those lines to keep in mind uh, that I teach in my classes when I teach them um, is that one shouldn't get caught up in that double bind about trying to act competent versus act nice, um, or trying to do it like a man versus doing it like a woman, that essentially you can't win in that kind of a trade-off. 
Hillary Clinton can't do it because you know someone will always think that she's if she uh, is acts too feminine she's being inauthentic and if she doesn't act feminine enough she's you know uh, <coughs> not someone to be admired and so on so uh, Robin Ely uh, again at Harvard and uh, her collaborator whose name I'm Deborah Rohde talk about opting out of that effort to balance between doing it like a man versus doing it like a woman, and instead focus on the goal of performance and learning your job and looking for opportunity and um, doing it in a way that engages and involves other people and helps them develop their capacities and their ability to win. And when you keep the focus on what you're trying to accomplish and uh, how you're going to get there and go around the obstacles as opposed to be stopped by them, you have a much greater opportunity to not be undone by these kinds of experiences. Um, this has been a really interesting conversation. And I'm just curious how you would see women and the world of work against what I consider the greater context, which is the American culture. I'm very interested in, say, the demise of the women's movement that I grew up with and the role models that I had in the 70s, like the Gloria Steinems and, you know, that whole, there were magazines, there were movements, they were very, very public voices who were inspirational and they were role models for us. That seems to have imploded or fizzled out. Um, the role models we see now, the Oprah Winfrey's, are more concerned about celebrity or very s soft subjects like, I don't know, spirituality is not soft, but... Oh. Um, so there seems to be, to me, a lack of cohes a cohesive movement and leadership. I see, not to diss Michelle Obama, but she's talking about not women's work, but, you know, eating habits. Um, the other thing, the concomitant trend that I've seen, we've all seen over the last, say, 20 years, is this hypersexualization of American women, American society, so that men and women seem farther apart in TV, in movies, in music. I mean, the, the sexual images, to me, are shocking, you know, and stunning, somebody who grew, grew up in the 70s. And I'm wor wondering whether the push for equality on the job front is made more difficult by these Absolutely. cultural and social trends. I mean, we're kind of fighting against, you know, a wave that's pushing us back. So any comments you would have on that, I would be interested. Okay, I'll comment. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, I, it, it, while, while it is the case that many of the social movements that some of us grew up with have dissipated, I mean, there's a certain sense in which you know, people have gotten older, they had to go in other directions, there became, uh, you know, some downsides of being involved in some of those kinds of things. But I think that to some extent the energy from those social movements got professionalized. I mean, there were, or, you know, professional organizations that got created as opposed to just social movements. So I don't think that the pressure for change has necessarily disappeared, but it's taken a different form. However, at the same time that those kinds of things have happened, there has been an organized effort to turn the country back from liberalism uh, that has been driven by a very well-financed right-wing movement. I talk about this in my book as well. And uh, they have had a strategy for doing that that included creating public intellectuals and generating books and capturing the media and the development of Fox News and uh, all kinds of organizations to sort of create model legislation and, and many, many kinds of uh, sectors of the uh, society have been influenced by this effort to turn the country back from those social movements. So obviously one of the uh, 
solutions would be to sort of recreate some aspect of those social movements, but it's a very difficult thing to do, uh, particularly because the Supreme Court and the finance, you know, the campaign finance laws and so on. So unfortunately, uh, as the successes of those social movements have begun to erode, um, the new generation of people, and I guess to some extent some of us as well, sort of have to fight those battles again. And uh, it's, you know, the, that, that's sort of an unsettling sort of thing to me. You know, I was very happy for those social movements and glad that I didn't have to be as involved as some people needed to be. But, um, you know, I do feel committed to supporting what other kind of efforts sort of emerge to sort of take things back again. You're right. Today is the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of Brown versus the Board of Education. And it's now the 50th anniversary of the voting rights act. And we're going back. If there are no we other questions, we will finish stuff here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.